pour que même. <rire> Guys, here we are, Southampton, sunny Southampton. Armel, Mark, Ash, thanks for, for this. And uh, yeah, guess what? We're here to talk about IMO 2020, Global Sulfur Cap. And this very table is actually made of sulfur. So the very topic, and 14 months away, so not a lot of time. So let's commence. <laughs> So the burning question is, Luca, is there going to be enough 0.5% product available come 2020? To me, the, the interesting question is, what customer asked me? And they asked me three questions. What, where, and when? And I'll take them one by one. So let's talk about the what. Everyone is concerned about what kind of fuel is going to be available. Is it going to be 0.5? Is it going to be 0.1? The other question is, where is going to be available? And there are indications that there may be significant differences between the product that's going to be available at hub ports versus the product that's going to be available at uh, smaller ports. And finally, the when. The when is, when are these products going to be available? Third quarter, fourth quarter, enough for ship owners to be able to switch over. Maybe I'll ask you a question, Mark. What do you think that, given the role that you play in the supply chain, is the biggest challenge for a company like yourself? Basically, our biggest challenge is really there's going to be extra grades being carried on the barges, so it's very important to make sure that the samples and things are kept correctly. And there's going to be a lot of concern from people working on board ships because they realise if they get this wrong, uh, there's going to be criminal charges and things, so the implications of, of bad samples or people not checking the fuel that they're getting on board can be very, very serious indeed for not just the people in the office, but also for the people on board the ships. Yeah, and certainly it will start with the product integrity on board your barge, up to the product integrity on board their tankage on board. Then they will certainly need to have a very deep Toro's fuel management in terms of tank engine on board to ensure the segregation of the different products. Well, I was going to say it's an interesting to have the, the different perspectives. As you know, it's a team effort between yourselves, the bunker tanker operator, and the customer. And we are seeing at the coal face or the bunker door, actually, uh, a lot of questions and inquiries. And frankly, there's a lot to do in the next 12 months. And it is being done, I'm, I'm sure. Exactly, it's one year, it's not anymore 14 months, because if the vessel want to be on compliance on January 1st, they will have to think to have their tankage clean, their tank segregation, tank management, ready in 12 months from now, at a minimum. Young as I look, I've been doing this <laughs> job for 30... Younger than me, actually, so no issues. <laughs> well, I've been doing this job for 35 years, and I actually think that this is probably the, the most fundamental change I've seen, personally, in all that time. If I can explain, Luca, for a second. We've grown up in a traditional world of two grades of fuel, fuel oil and gas oil. Yeah. You have the gas oil for smaller ships and also for the larger ships for the auxiliary engines and you have the heavier fuel oil for the larger ships for their main engines. It's been a relatively straightforward world really. They come alongside into the port, the barge comes to them and their primary concern has been am I going to get a good quality product uh, and fundamentally am I going to get the correct volume of it as well. What they haven't had in the past is the complication of having to worry about issues such as compatibility. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is a question that's being asked to us more and more at the bunker door. When we're talking about preparedness, is this industry prepared? Each of the components of that value chain, from the refinery, to the storage tank, to the logistics that move the product, to the customer, has to be prepared. So we spend so much time working with our customers through technical seminars, and for us, it's, it's just raising the awareness that we're going from an environment where they're used to, bank, to buy bunkers. And what I tell them is that this world it will change. You will need to manage bunkers, and the two very different skill sets. 
And I think at this point of time, actually, it's good to, to, to consider our product sampling policy, you know, that it's something that is very important for us and that if it was very important today, tomorrow it will be of utmost importance because the sampling, the marble sample, all this uh, representativeness of the products that we will deliver will be key for our customer. We do have some work to do with some of the customers, Candy. The chief engineers begin to ask us these questions now. Compatibility, will this mix? Am I going to get issues with it? How do I handle it? And I think that that's something which we certainly have to concentrate on in the coming months. A crew on board a vessel nowadays has much more technology uh, equipment to run with, for example, scrubbers, for example, ballast water treatment. It means like every, every single year they have to, to learn how to uh, handle new equipment. The fuel perhaps is not seen today as a very technical, I would say, uh, equipment, but tomorrow the knowledge of the fuel will be of utmost importance. But because it will be so different from what it has done up to now. We were saying about design, you see, that we have the segregation and we have the disciplines and the competence on the tankers, on the barges. But often you're, you're coming along to the, to the customer and he or she has one fuel connection. The, the, if, if they're going to carry a, a 0 0.5 and maybe, maybe even take a separate grade in a, in a different port, they can't actually completely segregate chief engineers and even master mariners coming down and asking more for certificates of quality and reassurances because I understand the sulfur levels will, be, will actually be very close to the limit so if we've got I understand that 0 0.50 is the absolute limit 5, 0 0.51 is out of tolerance exactly and this is where especially in the beginning at the time of the transition if you want to call it like this they haven't done their job in terms of tank cleaning, tank management. It will become very critical to ensure the compliance for, from, their, from their side. Back in 2015, when the 0.1 ECA came in just for the special areas such as the English Channel, compliance at that time, candidly, was, was more than even a soft start. We, we had uh, flag state authorities coming to us as bunker tanker experts asking how should we actually enforce this, what, what are we looking for? And so it was interesting that we were poacher term gamekeeper, if you like, but we helped them out. The, the, the thing being that it takes time to analyse a sample. So mostly what they were looking at was a paper trail to see does the BDN look correct, the CQ, and then uh, taking a sample which may take 72 hours, by which time the ship's gone. And that took a lot of steam out of the situation. And frankly, I don't think it actually was being checked that often. What's changed now is that uh, there were, we understand, portable appliances on the market where a flag state controller can go on board. With this portable kit, they can test the fuel in situ, in right. the engine room, and within minutes get an evidential proof of positive of what the sulfur level actually is at that moment in time. Ash, this is a great point because you just described mobile serve cylinder condition monitoring, which is the service that uh, um, we just launched is an upgrade of the service we have had now for a number of years. Scrape down oil analysis, but also has the possibility with X-ray technology, so this is testing lab accuracy to measure sulfur. Now, this will provide great peace of mind when a ship owner switches between fuels, 0.5 to 0.1, or leading to using 0.5 in order to measure the sulfur content. In, uh, in their fuels. Well, it's so important because, I mean, we are uh, hearing stories nowadays of emissions being monitored as you enter into ports, and uh, we've recently had a port state control on one of our ships where uh, we drive past uh, as you enter a port. There are sampling machines uh, at the side of the uh, harbour, and they pick up your emissions, and then they come on board if they f feel they've got an irregular reading. So, you know, there is lots of uh, detection taking place at the moment. Today we blend to viscosity. The industry blends to viscosity. In 2020 the industry is going to blend to sulfur because of that lack of low sulfur molecule potential, lack of that low sulfur molecules. 
but they're not going to leave dollars on the table. The vast majority of suppliers are going to take it right to the very limit. And, and of course, what we're seeing is that, is that we can keep the, the product segregated. We know what we're doing with tankers. It's, it, it, bunkering is our business. Yeah. When you get alongside to the customer, the chief engineer, he may be on a, a freighter or a, a row row, a cruiser, yeah, exactly. it could be anything. Bunkering is one of a hundred different tasks he has to do. Absolutely. It's not actually even a core activity much of the time. He's repairing engines, all sorts of things. So what they do, the customer is beginning to become aware of increasingly now is that the responsibility for the handling and the segregation of that product lies with them. As soon as, soon as we connect that hose and the fuel transferred through that bunker manifold, it's their responsibility. A continuous drip sample throughout the discharge flushing the sample before you start. Of course, we may have delivered a 3.5 compliant grade to the previous customer. We must, you will see that we would flush the sample of several litres and then immediately start a drip sample. Not every barge operator, I have to tell you, we know anecdotally does this. We know that, Ash. The cleanliness of the sampler itself, of the bottle also, are very important. And I will say certainly now we will also reinforce the message about the ceiling because as it will become much more, I will say, something very important in terms of compliance, in terms of documenting the bunker delivery note, it's very important that the seal number that is written onto the BDN is exactly the, the seal that is on through the bottle. So guys, I've been hearing this word sulfur integrity. I mean. What's your take on what sulphur integrity is? All of us will have a role to play from the refinery first to ensure that the product that we will produce will meet the MARPOL legislation, the 0.50% sulphur content, from the supply chain where you are a big part of it, and from the vessel itself. I mean, to me, the integrity is key to this. When you talk of sulphur integrity, it's integrity of the supply chain. You've got a quality product and a quality service with understanding of the requirements for segregation, for good housekeeping, for, for proper sampling technique. Tank cleaning. Absolutely. Lines cleaning. And training and awareness of the customer. That's really important. That's really important, Ash. But sulfur integrity, so we agree that sulfur integrity means everything along the supply chain. Absolutely. What suppliers can do in terms of managing sulfur, in terms of managing quality, what the logistics needs to be, and not only the transportation, but how the tanks will be managed, and what the customer can do. So, MEPC 73 just happened recently, and uh, two key decisions were taken there. The first one was reaffirmation of no delays on implementation of IMO 2020. So, it, but the other key decision was the fuel oil carriage ban. So effective 1st of March 2020, you're not going to be able to carry fuel oil in order to burn it. And that goes along the lines of something that uh, we all have supported of enforcement and how to make a level uh, playing field in, uh, in that sense. When we talk about reputation, uh, enforcement will mean that a vessel can be detained and therefore there is the possibility of a financial impact not only on the fine but also on uh, on the business and uh, that will be key and then reputation reputation you know you really don't want your uh, your name being in the news and being the company that has been fined and found not compliant so reputation Above and beyond the financial side, the immediate financial side, there is a much bigger, longer-term financial implication for the companies. We always talk about these things as if they're separate subjects, but actually it's all interlinked. Well done, Ash. Thank you so much, Luke. Thanks a lot for this party, Ashley. Well Thanks a lot. Well done. Thanks a lot, Mark. Oh. Thanks a lot. Thanks for a lot, <laughs> guys. It's going to be choppy waters, but is getting together is going to make a difference in this industry. So thank you very much for today. Okay. Thank you very much, Wittaker Tankers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.